this will hey everybody out there welcome to the show what we're doing today is we are working with the rock star of Google semantic search his name is David Amerland and we're doing a MBA marketing strategies series and we're talking about the Google plus semantic or the Google semantic search and the Google plus connection with a John Brown University show and it's being run today by Jim Shankel. So, Jim, tell us what's going on. Well, first of all, I, I appreciate you guys coming to uh, John Brown University to our Rogers campus here in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, it's great to have David here, and it's it's a pretty miraculous thing that he is here. Uh, Ronnie, we appreciate your being here as well. Ronnie joined us last week in class to uh, talk about this unique tool, uh, Hangouts and Hangouts on Air, and how we can utilize that in our, our marketing efforts. So. We've got a, um, a, a class that's watching from another room. They ha are, are taking uh, MBA marketing strategies. Um, they are typically, uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about John Brown. Uh, John Brown University has, uh, has been around for 90 years. Um, it is located in, in Salem Springs, Arkansas. Uh, in 2013, it was awarded the, uh, the number one U.S. News and World Report uh, Awarded at the number one Southern Regional College, so it's uh, it's a prestigious uh, Christian-based school, private school. Uh, recently, also uh, we were awarded a uh, or named uh, the uh, the Donald G. Soderquist College of Business. Um, Mr. Soderquist was the uh, chief executive officer of Walmart uh, for quite a number of years. So he worked with Sam Walton. The, um, a couple of th things about the students, uh, typically the students here are going to be from the local companies. Uh, we have three large companies located in the area about five minutes from here is uh, uh, J.B. Hunt Transportation, that's a Fortune 500 company. Uh, probably another 15 minutes down the road is, uh, is Tyson Foods, which is a Fortune 100 company. A little bit further down there is uh, in Fayetteville is the University of Arkansas. and then. Um, North of us is, um, is the Fortune One, we like to call it, which is Walmart. Um, they are about 10 minutes away. So we, uh, as, and we also, in this area, uh, a lot of the students come from not only those, those in, in smaller businesses as well, uh, but we've also got a unique thing. This is very much an, an international community. I grew up in South Arkansas, and this is quite different from what I grew up in. Um, we have, because of Walmart, uh, we have probably 1,200 or, or more uh, vendor teams, supplier teams they call them here, and what they do is they service the Walmart account and some uh, the largest team is Procter & Gamble which has about 200 people so it ranges from one person all the way up so from those companies, all those companies are our students, we've got a good group, got a good school and a very very uh, good faculty. Uh, I was happy about, uh, about four years ago to be named an uh, adjunct lecturer and I focus on marketing strategies as well as in the spring I'm going to be doing a designing strategies company uh, or sub, uh, course and then we've got something unique that's going to be set up for entrepreneurs um, uh, and we'll have, uh, have, a, have a symposium that we'll do to start off more of an emphasis on helping baby boomers um, to be who are getting at the end of their careers and really want to do something else and be entrepreneurs and potentially coaches and we'll be training them on that, and my partners on that are a fellow named William Collins. He's got a lot of experience with the internet, as well as the uh, former head of uh, people and uh, training for Walmart stores. Retired from that, so uh, should have got a lot of things going on up here. And you know, this this program we're doing here um, is important. Um, I got to know. Uh, I got on the uh, on the uh, Google Plus about two week, two months ago. Met David. Um, and I think right now you're seeing an example of just how powerful uh, Google Plus and Google Semantic Search are. That uh, within two months, I was able to uh, to get David to come in, and we were one of the point I'll make along, along that, and then I'll let, turn it over to David. Is that um, we were the first uh, MBA program and the second college or second university in the in the world, the first MBA program to adopt his book, Google Semantic Search. And I'm glad to be able to do that because, as the dean told me the other day, a lot of times these textbooks are out of date, and with everything moving as quickly as they can, you can't have a textbook that's two, three years out of date, even when they're published. So, uh, having David's uh, uh, book in the class and discussing that and teaching that, and having resources like a Ronnie Benser, the Hangout Helper, come in and, and help, uh, just makes all the difference in the world. And it, it shows 
uh, you'll, you'll see some comments and questions coming in from the students. Uh, they, they know their stuff, they're smart, they're older, and they, uh, they really apply themselves. So they're going to they're gonna enjoy this session tonight. Great. David, so, uh, David, what I'd like for you to do is really just, uh, uh, you know, you can get this Google Semantic Search can sound very, um, very intimidating in a way, and, you know, certainly when you're talking to technical people, uh, it can get very much in the weeds, but the good thing about your book, I mean, the thing I like so much about it, I mean, I'll, I'll, sh I'll give you an example of it. I mean, all through, all through this book, you'll, I have tabs that I've, I've pointed out. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, is, it is so easy to be able to follow it. I mean, I, I just, it, it does get deep, and you got, but you've got a lot of footnotes where you put things at the end um, to, for those who wish to go deep. But this is a great book for, I mean, it's a very interesting book. And it's such a big major, I mean, the, the two points that came out of this for me, I mean, there's probably a lot more, but two that really jump out, in addition to the fact that uh, that search really is marketing, and, and we all need to understand that a lot of the purchasing decision starts with, with a search. But the thing that was really interesting was how much um, that, in, in the change, that relationships mean so much. I mean, it's moved, it used to be that years ago, years ago, they had... Uh, uh, relationships meant everything, and then it became transactional. And now things are, Google is, is actually with this uh, new way that they're looking at things is causing people to want to, uh, to, to have better behavior on, on, on the web and to, uh, to want to engage and to create relationships. And like I said before, I mean, this, this has, a, and with the, the video capability, has the ability to create some relationships with people that I obviously never would have known you guys uh, before. So I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to address it, how the, uh, uh, this Google semantic search, what it is, a little bit of that, but how it affects the, uh, the MBA students' uh, employers, affects their careers, how it affects them, as, uh, them personally. And then both the students and for, for baby boomers. So I, that's a little bit to bite off. You think we can handle that in an hour? <laughs> Thank you, Jim, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here, actually. And, and very much, this is, this is a lot of the stuff which I do all year round in terms of helping um, large corporations get their executive teams right up to speed. So this is um, very much the audience, funnily enough, which I had in mind when I was writing the book. Um, and I structured it in a way that is very accessible precisely because uh, semantic search from a technical point of view is extremely complicated. Um, we usually say search is not rocket science. Well, semantic search is very close to rocket science, but it doesn't really concern us because its effects are very accessible. And it is probably the biggest disrupt we have faced in terms of marketing and how we operate since the Industrial Revolution. And I say this with quite a very um, a studied approach because the Industrial Revolution was the point where we began to um, scale things up and create the transactional approach um, which has led us for the last 200 years. And before that, everything was very small and personable and worked around or evolved around um, relationships which allowed us to examine the value of any kind of transactional um, uh, kind of um, relationship we entered into. So we had personal relationships um, sort of um, being the bedrock of transactional ones. The world grew big. <laughs> And it became complicated, and we had we created very complicated structures to be able to operate in that. And those structures were driven by processes because processes is how companies work, and those processes were broken down into very specific steps because this is how we control them, and this is how we basically make sure that they work for us and do what we expect them to do. And then with the 21st century, we got into a world which is too complicated and too big and at the same time really connected. And that created a disrupt in its own right. When you have a world which is so big, what you get is essentially noise. And you get so much noise that it drowns out any kind of signal. This is a paradox because essentially every bit of noise potentially is a signal. And what do I mean by that? Suppose, um, suppose we all started talking at the same time and we are 30 people in a room and somebody watching those 30 people sees a lot of noise and no signal at all, yet if we're only talking to two, three people next to us within that large sound which nobody can make head or tail out of, those two, three people can actually connect and they can create um, a conversation despite the fact that they're surrounded by noise. So this is the paradox of the party room where you can actually have a kind of 
a conversation in a very crowded and loud environment. Now suppose we scale that across the world and the way we do that of course is with search which means search has to work differently. It has to allow us to create our own signals from the noise which surrounds the big data solution or the big data problem that floats everywhere. And, and that in a nutshell is the outline of how semantic search came to be the thing, the force that it is today and why it actually became um, a necessity in many ways um, in, in the way we operate. Well there's no question about it that it, it, it seems to pick up every signal out there and, that, and we all have to be recognizing that, that when, you've, when you're on the web or you're on Gmail, uh, it's, it's, being, it's being analyzed from a semantic standpoint. It doesn't mean they're watching you at all, like NSA, it's not that. But the fact are that is that when I search uh, my next door neighbor the same terms, if he used the same terms, we get different uh, results on the first page. Exactly, and, and actually I'm very glad you brought this point up because this again goes back to the party analogy. You know, you have 30 people in the room, they're all talking at the same time. To an outsider, there's absolutely you know, a lot of noise, but to the small groups within the group, the tangen tangential points of contact where you're talking to two or three people make perfect sense. And if you were to move around and leave one group of people and join another one, then you join that conversation and that becomes meaningful for you. But before you joined it, it was just noise surrounding you. So essentially what semantic search does is it, it works on three levels. The first level is the web itself, which is a web of data, and it indexes that web in a very complicated and complex way. The second level is your own personal signals. So it basically, as you say, scans everything you do pretty much on the web um, and tries to understand who you are digitally. It tries to see what your um, preferences are, what your search patterns are, what your connections are, trying to understand your profile. And then it brings those two together at the point of contact, which is, which is the search box. And at the search box, it tries to look not at just the words which you have typed in there, which in the past were very keyword driven and they were very cut and dry, and search didn't really understand them. It statistically analyzed them and gave us a statistically accurate solution to what we actually were looking for. But now it tries to understand them in terms of what you have asked and then in terms of the intent of what you want to actually find. And those three things come together almost like a sandwich. And mm -hmm. they, when they work, they work exceedingly well, which is why you get constantly personalized results. So essentially, at the extreme end of semantic search, we'll all be going around surrounded by our own personal data cloud, which essentially will affect the questions we're asking because we're not asking them from the same perspective. So, Let's see. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the things that, it, that this truly is an inflection point it, that it struck me is being very similar to something I experienced about 15 years ago when I looked up one day and my sister had a, a friend who had uh, left to FedEx and had gone to work for this little company out in California and she had managed to get some of, some of the founders stock for a little company called Netscape. And she was telling me that uh, about this thing called the internet and I just looked, I felt like I was obsolete. I mean the world was, ta was changing and going. So um, I bought a product from uh, Microsoft called uh, FrontPage and got a buddy named Ed Horrell and Ed was a telecom consultant and we created what was then called an e-zine and then e-commerce. They didn't call them those things at that time but um, you know they had just come out with high speed uh, uh, internet and uh, I mean they were, they, it was primitive what we were doing and everybody looked at us like we were crazy but we were creating a double sided market but it didn't work because he wrote a lot of articles but nobody read them so uh, anybody who's out there in blogging can appreciate that but it was the the same thing i started noticing when uh, my 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 business partner bill collins william collins um, sent me this link to say uh, take a look at this guy uh, martin Sherverson, Sherverson, sorry um, a Brit who's, who's gotten some things going on in Google Plus and in the course of that looking at this began to I saw your book and saw you guys you and Ronnie and Martin were on a, a, a show Scott was actually on there too and saw some things that were that were just to me almost parallel to what I had seen 15 years ago and I, the thing that I guess I wonder about with all of that and seeing this change going on I mean it's so nice to be at the very forefront of this 
just like the school, uh, John Brown University is right at the forefront of being able to learn these things and how to apply them. The thing I'm wondering about is what's going on with the people who are being disrupted? What's happening with the big companies? How are they adjusting to it now? Are they? And small businesses, are they? And you know, there's a, probably a lot of questions in this, mm. but I'll ask you to take which one of them you want to. But talk, <laughs> a, talk a little bit about what's happening to the, you know, the traditional way that it's going on, and then um, where you see things going over the next year or so as this uh, begins to really uh, go through the economy with G Plus supporting Google Semantic Search. Okay, um, a lot of questions. You're quite right, and I'm actually very glad you started with '98 because. Um, the internet or the web basically started around 95 and started taking off and there was a lot of excitement at the time. It was exciting because we felt the world was being connected and in a way it was but not quite well enough. And we also felt that there was a certain opportunity in terms of lowering costs and broadening vistas which from a commerce point of view is absolutely fantastic because you can market to a lot more people a lot more effectively. Also for smaller operators it was great because they thought the web is a great leveler. Somebody with a great idea, a great product perhaps, and a great website could be almost as good as a large corporation with deeper pockets and bigger manpower. A few years on now, <laughs> we know that this is not quite the case because essentially all the corporate cor corporations are a lot slower to react. They have better processes and they have a methodology which ensures that they trial things, they put them into place, and they get the job done in a more efficient way. And consistency is one of their greatest greatest strengths. Until now, <laughs> things have changed. And why have they changed? They've changed very radically because essentially what's happened now, we have from a technological point of view, the um, nuanced approach and the tools necessary to actually work on the web as personably and as closely with people as we did offline. And like corporations were not very good at coming to the village square in the pre-industrial revolution world and trying to sell something, why weren't they very good at this? Because they were strangers and they had a strange approach. And they weren't from around here. They created instant mistrust. And the moment they tried to tell us how good they were, we felt they were pushing a lot harder than they should and we mistrusted them even more. And if this rings a bell, well, here we are. We've got to the situation where the traditional forms of advertising, which is the hard sell of the corporation, which is the way traditionally it has created trust, found its audience, uh, and, and connected with them, don't work anymore. They don't work as well. And the reason they don't work is because that audience now is a lot more resistant to the hard sell, is a lot more resistant to the slickness of the packaged approach, and wants basically to either get recommendations through networks and friends or wants to connect with any kind of corporation at the same level as they would with networks of friends, which means that they need to have a clear identity of who is it who does the selling and why, what's their shared value, and how can they sort of work together to complete the transaction. This is really radical because corporations are not really geared to work like this. When you run any kind of corporation where you have managers and managerial structures and processes and reports and teams and people being accountable and then shareholders who are actually expect to hear to see reports which show them a profit and loss a balance balance sheet. Personality and shared values with potential customers don't really come into this very easily. But they really have to because this is the way you connect with your audience. And this is a challenge which uh, funnily enough is the same whether you're a small operator or a large conglomerate running you know tens of thousands of people across the world. The good news, and there is good news in this, is that there are practical, th practical things we can actually do to um, help implement processes which create a kind of personality. The bad news of that is that it's just disruptive. <laughs> you need to sort of embrace change and start rolling with it. Yeah, and so often it's, it's difficult for companies to do that. I mean, I, I can recall when I've worked in the past with big companies, I'd, I'd walk around the plant for one company I worked for down in Texas, and, and I'd ask questions of just out of curiosity, why do y'all do that? And the, and the answer was always, we've always done it that way. I mean, that's, we've done it that way ever, ever since they built the cement plant, which is where they said yes. it in Midlothian. But, and it's so, you know, and, and you, you, the world changes. I mean, every day uh, new technology comes on, new relationships come on, competition. I mean, who, who'd have thought? I, when I was in business school 35 years ago, um, 
there was one course on in international uh, international business, and today you know it, uh, there there's everybody has to think about that because our competition's everywhere. Exactly, and and I mean this is only one small example of it. As a matter of fact, you're quite right. We have had change now at a corporate stroke large business level since the mid early to mid 80s and it hasn't really slowed down at all so theoretically we should be able to embrace this change a lot easier the fact that we can't or we don't uh, indicates how disruptive it is and it is really disruptive because what has happened really is the customer or the traditional customer the traditional audience that a traditional business is actually chasing has now moved and in order for that business now to actually target it more effectively it needs to evolve with that customer, with that audience. It needs to be as agile, it needs to be as personal, it needs to be as personable and that's the hard bit because it has to change internally and internally we know that corporations have always had the departments and those departments come with teams and those teams come with managers and everybody comes with careers and turfs and looking out for your job first, which is perfectly understandable. This is no way um, any kind of um, uh, judgment on this. It's exactly the way we operate because it has always worked. And now we need to break down those barriers and we need to start talking to each other within the organization itself. And it's difficult because you need to put your cards on the table, you need to sort of start thinking less about agendas and more about shared goals within the organization. You need to start creating the kind of cognitive surplus within the organization that exists outside it. And what do I mean by that? When I make a purchasing decision, for instance, I have two choices. I can go down the path where I do my research, I sort of think that I know what I need, and then I go ahead and purchase it. And that's me working on my own. Or I can tap into the cognitive surplus of my social network. I can ask you, for example, if I know you, and you can recommend somebody else to me who will probably re recommend me to somebody else, and they'll say, hey, you know, what you're thinking of buying I've already bought and it's not as great as they say for instance or they may conversely say hey you know it's the best thing since sliced bread buy it no questions asked but either way the point is that I don't make that purchasing decision in um, a, 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 an uninformed way based only on my own judgment and that's the big difference so if you're trying to sell that to me now and you're trying to sell it to me as you only on your own and you're the only person responsible for selling in your organization you're facing a really difficult task because your organization will traditionally arm you with very specific um, ways of selling because you know this is what organizations do they'll tell you these are the selling points this is the packaging this is the price point and perhaps you can give a discount up to this point and no further you come towards me now so thinking that okay you're going to um, catch my attention with the packaging, give me the price point, and if I sort of uh, sit on the fence a little bit, you can uh, basically um, give me the discount and close the sale. And this doesn't work anymore because this is what this is not what I want to hear. So essentially, you need to be able to network inside your organization the same way. You need to have input from your sales team, the PR team, perhaps the product production people. You need to know about potential problems. And if you have all that knowledge and you're armed with all those things, then you become a lot better at it. The thing that, I, that really struck me on this and how quickly it's moving was um, two months ago when, when you and I met online, I mean, you were great about uh, responding to comments, and I, I hit you with one uh, comment. I tried, to, I tried to be kind of provocative to catch your attention, and, uh, you know, and, and you, you're really good about engaging with your your audience, which is is one of the great things about this. It's an interactive medium, so let's yes. use it interactively, and that's what's so unique. Yeah. But when we met uh, online, you were you had 22,000 followers, and that had built up over a period of uh, of um, I think uh, about a year and a half. I saw something from uh, Scott the other day that showed the hockey stick that happened about about two weeks later. Uh, it went to the point in two months where it's gone to 150,000 people plus from 22,000. So um, I think the, it's, there's no question the market's recognizing that there's a need out there, but going with that, 
um, I don't see that those those followers are coming from traditional businesses. I suspect it's coming from the SEO community that's trying to understand more about what's going on. You've been on several Hangouts on Air, and you begin to get the word out. Your book was published in, in the middle of July, I believe. So things begin to work, and you, you're a bestseller on that. But you know, even with all of that, I, I was really surprised um, about a month ago, I went up to my 35th reunion, and I carried your book all over uh, that weekend. And in Boston, I, you know, you would, you, I would have thought that people would have known it. And I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a strike. I kept showing it around. And I went to uh, one session that was about um, uh, uh, Facebook and Google and Amazon and LinkedIn and who's going who's gonna to be the winners in the future. And never once did they mention anything about semantic search. And I talked to the professors afterwards and they didn't know anything about it. Um, and then the, the surprising thing was there was one gentleman, I won't mention his name, but he's head of a large organization, um, and I would have thought he'd know something about it, and, and he did not, or at least he, he may have known, but he was playing coy. Um, but then what was, what was really, so it, it was surprising that, you know, that it's not being taught. I mean, I feel very, very, uh, you know, I hate to use the word proud because that's probably the wrong word, but the fact that we're able to, to be ahead of, you know what some people consider one of the top business schools to to um, to to be in this in this market. So, do you find that in the corporate world that the top people are just simply not ready to to accept this yet? And and you know we, you you address that to some degree, but is it just the fact that uh, you know, it's going to have to come up from the bottom? Well. It Semantic search in many ways is very disruptive. It's disruptive to its own industry when it comes to SEOs and it's disruptive to marketing when it comes to marketing organizations and in many ways it's also disruptive to the audience, the, the traditional customer or consumer because now they also connect with their um, research and what they find and information they find and the products they find in an entirely different way. When such profound disruption happens anywhere, the first um, instinct is to deny it. And you deny it because you have the luxury of seeing change happen, which you don't really understand. And your first instinct of that is to simply do what you do, but only more so. And I see this pretty much across the entire um, large marketing, uh, large um, conglomerate um, industry in terms of the businesses which operate. I even see it in terms of smaller SEO studios who now think, okay, they need to do something different in terms of the semantic web. They need to connect with their customers in a different way and help the, those businesses understand a change which they haven't clearly understood themselves because they now need to change their traditional practices. And this is a difficult pill to swallow because they need to go back to their customers and say, what we've been doing up to now no longer works. We're going to do something entirely different and it's going to cost you so much more because it entails more work in the first instance. Um, this is a hard message to actually get across. And the moment you realize how difficult it is, there's always a little bit of um, a reaction against it. Um, now, inevitably, change happens. And it happens not because it is nice to happen, it happens because it has to happen. The market is moving, it is shifting, um, customers and the target audience are moving with it a lot faster because they're individuals and businesses are following suit. It is encouraging and you are one of the um, points which, or one of the bright lights basically of, of this change, it is encouraging that um, the businesses are beginning to understand that they need to grasp what is necessary now and how then they can go back into their own work environments and start to implement it. And at this point perhaps I can um, explain a couple of points about semantic search and one of the Please. things which it, which it does um, in terms of creating personal relationships, we have already seen how the customers um, using their own personal networks to find recommendations, but one of the things which Google has made a big play on is that semantic search is going from websites to people. And this is sometimes very difficult to understand because we still use websites to find information, we, find, we use websites to complete transactions on, and we use websites to actually buy products from. So for, on the surface of it, nothing has changed, but actually a lot has changed because those websites wouldn't do any business 
or wouldn't come up in search or the information wouldn't be as valid in terms of how we appraise it if they didn't come through a recommendation, a resharing, an interaction or an engagement in a social network. And Google Plus is an example, but obviously you can get a similar effect through Twitter and Facebook or any combination of these three. So essentially, when it comes to, let's say, what you know, you think on the practical side, what is it that I need to do in order to help my business in the semantic web? The main thing which you have to do there is actually create the kind of social footprint which allows your business to surface in a social environment being personable first. So essentially you need to go back on the drawing on the drawing board and basically think what are the values which got me into business in the first place? What am I known for best? How do I get those things across in terms of content, outreach, even advertising? to my um, target audience and then how do I measure the effect? Now these are traditional business practices so all that needs to change is an awareness of how you begin to create or identify the business identity which you already have and then use content, use social engagement on the web, use interaction again on the web to get that across, drive, find your audience, drive it to your business place on the web and essentially complete the transaction. So this is the path which takes us, makes the transition complete from websites to people because now it's people first and that's where you start and you complete things on your website. So this is the big change. Well, and one of the things that I've found so fascinating from my own perspective is I, I've never, I've never cared at all for Facebook. I, it just, you know, it left me kind of cold. I, I couldn't, maybe I don't have any friends, so uh, I wasn't able to, uh, <laughs> to get anybody. But that's what's been really interesting about, about Google+. Plus. I thought it would be the same thing as social media. And I heard a, a really good comment, a good uh, word term that was used in a, in, a, in a program you were in earlier today, which is, it's not, uh, Google+, Plus is not social media. It's, it's the social level, I think the term is. Social layer. Is. It's a social layer, layer. Yeah. yes. Well, it, it's a, it's a, it, this is a significant difference because we think of a traditional social network as the digital equivalent of a friendship, real world, small circle of friends in, 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 in real life. And it does, I mean, uh, Google Plus doesn't work that way. Um, Facebook does because normally you go on Facebook to find the friends that you have in real life and connect, connect with them or even reconnect with them if you knew them in the past. But that doesn't actually, if you think about it, significantly broaden your world. And essentially one of the powers, one of the big powerful effects of the semantic web and of the digital interaction is that it broadens your horizon to the point that you actually tap into this cognitive surplus which I spoke about earlier. It makes you smarter, more capable, uh, able to be more productive and able to achieve more in a shorter time. And this is the addictive quality of it. And exactly. essentially, it really is. And essentially, Google Plus has all those tools that allow you to do that. And if we forget for a minute that we're talking about commerce and, and, and business, and if we just take a purely informational approach, if you think to yourself, okay, I know nothing about marketing, and I need to learn, and I give myself two months to do so. Normally, that's a really tall order. But you go into Google Plus, and not only will you find the information that you need, but you also get immediate access to experts who are perfectly willing to give you time and expertise which in the past would have cost money and actually help you along in your journey so they create a shortcut which you wouldn't have got anywhere else and now you're going to say okay if they do that what's the value to them well here's what it is by doing that as an expert you increase your own reputational status so essentially there's a, a, a hidden capital it's called a reputational capital, which works for the expert. At the same time, you create a point of contact with a potential marketer. So if you get a brand new person who wants to become a marketer and they got that knowledge and they create their own social network, now they have power and weight of their own and they're connected with the expert. So suddenly, this kind of balance of power um, allows both of them to gain in different ways, but mutually. And, and that, is the, that is the true power of a social layer. Essentially, a social layer allows things to be tied together across the web in a mutually balanced way. And this is, this is new. We never had that before.
Let me ask a question here for a second. Yeah. Um, I see an interesting parallel because, for example, Google Plus, by the traditional world, is still not even something that's worth paying attention to. By many people, right? Uh, yes, I don't know. Yeah, don't of know. course. Yeah, it's still early days. Absolutely. Okay. I agree with that. And for some, semantic search is also something that just doesn't make sense. Why should I even care? And isn't it interesting how those that basically poo-poo, if that's the expression I could use, the concept <laughs> of Google it's a technical Google, term, right? <laughs> yeah, having any value, it's not worth it. It's not worth your time. Nobody's there, right? That's the, yes. the funny thing that they'll say, yeah. and they need to defend their decision to say that, and so they'll double down. Like you were saying, some organizations that aren't interested in learning about semantic search because it wasn't invented here, or it's something different, and so they continue to do what they've been doing before. Do you Can you talk a little bit to, to the parallel of what Google Plus and semantic search and how they're sort of both happening regardless, but people want to yeah. ignore it? Absolutely. I mean, as a matter of fact, if we go back a little bit earlier to the early days of the internet, there's another parallel there where a lot of companies were resisting going online for any kind of reasons. First of all, they said, you know, we are local. We don't want to market globally. Or they would go the other way. We are global. We don't want to market locally. Um, who's going to trust the web with their transactional details and their credit cards. You know, the, all these objections came up. And we had the same sort of bell curve of adoption where a lot of companies resisted going online until it became inevitable. And the moment it became inevitable, you got this sort of wholesale uh, transfer of all their businesses willy-nilly, without much thinking, online thinking was going to actually solve everything. And it, and it doesn't. You really need to think about it. So that's, that's the sort of parallel with the past. And now if we look at, quite rightly, identified that both semantic search and Google Plus seem to be um, a minority in terms of awareness, and that's true because we're still at a very early adopter level. And what this does really is it allows those who come into it early on to take advantage of the opportunities to create the kind of um, processes that will help them in the long term. And those who get left behind thinking, okay, it's not for us or it's got nothing to do with us. When it becomes inevitable, they're going to, again, come into it willy-nilly, trip up, make all sorts of mistakes, and then try to fix it and actually move forward. Google Plus, as a, as a social layer, is an, in, an intrinsic part of semantic search. And why do I say that? Well, because essentially semantic search is about, and to get a little bit technical, is about entities and Entities here is understanding people and things as people and things, not just coded words. It's about ontology, and the ontology here is the relationship between entities. And the social layer allows Google search to basically mine those relationships, to understand how they connect, to understand how the relational values go. And it does this automatically in many ways. If you give a machine a set of data, and it basically starts to sort of sorting through the data based on a program which allows it to cluster things together according to similarities, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you're going to get a, a meaningful signal out of the clustering. So, you know, you're going to say, okay, I've got here, for instance, 100 million tennis balls and 65 million are green and 35 million are red. That means something. That Clustering actually means something, and, and based on that meaning, then you can infer other things, and you can deduce other things, which allows you to take that data and basically do something with it. And, and that essentially is the best definition of what semantic is. You take data, you connect it together, you understand what it means, and once you understand what it means, you take that meaning and you actually use it, whereas in the past you couldn't. So that's how... Um, businesses now using that kind of approach, those who actually do, to work better and work smarter and find new solutions to the problems that they face. And one thing that I've, I will say in, the, in defense of that, uh, the, C, the uh, CEO that I mentioned that um, I ran into at uh, my reunion, uh, when I was back here, um, we set up, I'm an entrepreneur and we've set up some businesses here and uh, one of my good friends is uh, who's was a uh, a salesperson at uh, one of them and is now the manager of a company called Rockfish Inter Interactive. Uh, they do a lot of work for Walmart and Sam's Club and, and Bill was right on top of it. I mean, he, when I showed him the book, they were, he, he was speaking at a uh, 
what we call doing business in Bentonville best practices series. And he had two of his people with him, one from Dallas office uh, for Rockfish. They were, um, and, and they were impressed the fact that not only did I have your book, David, but that I, I actually had, had these uh, sticky notes in it and, and marked up so I'd actually read it. So, <laughs> but it was, the thing is, I think that there are, as time goes on, people are, people are going to bubble up through the organization to be able to bring this on. But that ties into to my passion, which is, is helping entrepreneurs and especially helping baby boomers uh, to be able to identify and to pursue their purpose because nowadays uh, people are getting to the end of their careers like I am. I turned 65 last week and I have no desire whatsoever to retire and, and it doesn't seem like I run into any baby boomers who do. And if we can now begin to to teach them and, and train them on some tools that are actually very simple, I mean some basic ones that the, the team that I talked about a while ago, we're going to be teaching. It gives opportunity for the you know the small guy to be able to stand heads up and even ahead of, frankly, in their niches, some passion that they've got that they're able to 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 get to the first page and the first rank in Google because they're in there all the time engaging with crowd. Whereas the big companies don't have that kind of interaction with their employees. Okay, that's, so, that, that's a very telling remark actually because in many ways semantic search does away with the um, technical layers of marketing and traditional digital marketing we did in the past. And it breaks completely with the tradition we have had of scaling things and dressing them up, which is where we've been going for the last 200 years. It takes us back to the village square and if you go to back to the pre-industrial age village square, when you get onto the village square and you want to buy something, what do you do? Well, you go to the person you know, and they probably know you. And because they know you, they're unlikely to give you substandard goods and they're unlikely to rip you off because they work through word of mouth. So if they do that, they're basically hurting themselves and they're not really making enough from you to justify their doing so. So they tend to give you the best service possible because it's good for them and it's also good for you. And here you work in alignment. What is good for them, or rather what is good for you, is also good for them. If you don't know that person, however, what do you do? You go to somebody whom you do know and you say, listen, what I want to buy is, you know, whatever it is. It could be a new set of horses for your horse, or it could be a, new, a brand new sword so you can go and kill your neighbor, <laughs> for instance. So you say to your friend, you know, where can I get a, a, a really good um, set of horseshoes or a really sharp sword? And, you know, your friend that tells you, hey, you know, you go to that person and tell them I send you, and, you know, they're really cool. They'll really help you out. And that's how you did business in the past. And in that setting, really what rose were two things. There's value and quality. Value in terms of what you valued and quality in terms of what you actually received. And the same things now come into play now on a global level, on the web, um, digitally. So basically, and here's the great leveler. We hope the internet would have been the great leveler, and it wasn't. But now we get into semantic search, we get into semantic web, and actually that is the great leveler because when you now have a signal which is unique to you, when you do a search, for instance, and the information you find, the product you find is unique to your search and your particular needs, then what is really important is this uh, transaction which you enter with that person or that company on one-to-one -one and what the value of the transaction is to you. So a person who has the quality and they have the word of mouth, will actually be able, a small operator will be able to work on as big a stage as the web, as a big company, on the same level now. It doesn't matter if you have a team of 10,000 people doing your bidding or you're somebody, some guy um, working from your back bedroom, for instance. What really matters is, can you generate the right social signals? Can you convince your public that you are the real McCoy? Can you consistently deliver value to those you actually transact with and if the answer is yes to all those things, that's it. You're onto a winner and it doesn't matter you know, if you are huge or very small and that is very empowering. It's also very challenging obviously because as you said, large corporations are not used to working this way. They've been used to throwing money and manpower problems and thinking, okay, that's all it takes to actually solve them. It doesn't anymore. You've got to go back to the drawing board. You've got to say, is my quality up to standard? Does it meet the expectations of my public? Do I engage with them and let them know that, hey, you know, I value them as customers instead of seeing them as numbers which give me dollars? And 
These are hard questions to answer. They require a lot of soul searching, which again is not something large corporations get into. Even smaller ones, really. <laughs> it requires a lot of um, real thinking in terms of their sales teams, in terms of their people, because if you need to connect at that level in the web, then you need to understand how do you do it? How do you break down your content to get a kind of interaction? How do you present yourself to show that, hey, you are people first and a company second? So that's the kind of thinking that's actually required now at a business level. Yeah, it's no longer the, 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 you know, the one with the, you know, the most resources to be able to win. I mean, one of the things we teach in, in the class, for instance, is the evolution where, um, to, to where today the consumer is the, is the boss. It, it, in the beginning, it was the, the manufacturer. They were the ones that had the power. They had the, uh, the scale. And then they would, the distributors, uh, with Walmart being probably the prime example of somebody that uh, was leading it because of their, their dominance and, and data and being able to uh, understand what was going on out there in the field, they, they got the power and accumulated it. And now it's moved to the consumer. And, and um, I was, I was at, a, at a session, for instance, uh, the other day that uh, Bill Akins, I was mentioning about Rockfish, Bill, uh, and Mike Grain from Walmart and several, they, they've created a product that can take that last mile where they can, they can see the data of what's going on. And so the power to the consumer has been rapid with the internet, but where it's the consumer, but then not only the consumer with the big manufacturer, but to be able to find these niche products that people have a passion for and they are willing to engage, it just it creates a dynamic that's totally different and it's what the country needs and it's also yes. the kind of thing that can release a lot of creativity because you know, the statistics show 15 20 percent of the people out there like their job and everybody else is looking for something else so to be able to engage in, an, in something like Google semantic search which is frankly addictive I mean I, I like I said before Facebook I didn't care much for Google's, Google Plus is is the kind of thing that you get on and you start creating relationships and you have one-on-one -on -one interaction with people that you see on the web and they'll they'll engage with you that's heady and that really causes individuals to want to do more of it now when you say individuals just so you know we got about 15 minutes left for this time um, people buy from people right I mean that was the way it was with the village square yeah, yeah exactly. and now I think we've gone full circle and I think when an organization can start to embrace some of that and find a way to actually put a face on the organization then things might really change. Hmm. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. And and this is the difficulty that most businesses actually face. Um, they know that they need to change. And actually, there's a real disconnect in most businesses because the executives at mid to top level understand that they need to change. But the people actually running the organization or greenlighting the, the decisions are still fighting the way they used to in the 20th century. And that kind of mindset within, which exists within most large businesses creates a, dis a disconnect um, which will take a little bit of time to actually overcome. Um, it even exists within medium-sized businesses. And it's only people who work at a very small level or very small scale or even at an individual level, they actually get the change that's happening and are able to reposition themselves quickly enough to actually um, take advantage of this. Regardless of that fact, they all face the same problem, which is time. Because you don't go into business in order to become a social media engager, or a publisher of content, or a photographer of photographs, or a meme creator. And these are all activities which you actually have to learn to engage on the web. And this is where it becomes really new and scary, because it feels like it's completely outside your control, you think it's completely outside your, your skill set. In most cases, it's also outside your knowledge, and you're not sure what you're doing. But in terms of businesses, um, we always been able to engage in activities in the past which had a very specific goal. And any kind of business is good in creating a, a line of um, reasoning which starts off with an activity which supposed to, is supposed to have an intent, and then it has some kind of uh, assessment which allows you to determine the return on the investment of time that you actually engaged in. Now these questions don't change. So essentially any kind of business engaging digitally today 
and trying to become very personal and very personable and very socially engaging still has to go back to those basic questions. It has to say, what do I do? How do I do it? How do I test it? So I can see what results I get. And if you haven't, if you're not able to actually work out that kind of process, then you are basically wasting time and possibly money. So really, you need to have those three different dif uh, se separate questions linked into a chain which allows you to assess how effective you are on the web, and what do you do, how do you do it, and how do you test it so that you know you, it's actually working for you. Well, as a person that's, uh, you know, I consider myself a deal maker. I came up here 10 years ago and, um, you know, I, 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 I spent a lot of years as a self-made, uh, or working as a deal maker for a self-made billionaire in the game of golf, and I see that you know the the opportunities. I mean, I've started several companies with guys up here, and the opportunity to be able to do that and not need a lot of resources to be able to do it are, are fascinating. So I, I keep coming back to what the entrepreneur can do and how individuals, and even even if they're inside a company, they they must be an, an entrepreneur. Um, everybody's, it seems like these days, has got to be looking at themselves as a uh, free agent because uh, they could you know, ha be independent pretty quickly sometimes the way companies that's, work. That's but a hugely I, important point and I'm very glad you actually made it because you're right, you have to be creative because it's the only way that you can actually be personable even if you're within a large corporation. If you go into a job today in a large company and you expect to sit in a cubicle or somebody will actually give you something to do, you do it at the end of the day, you're going to go home and forget about it and you know it's going to be done almost blindly. Well, that kind of job doesn't exist anymore. You need to be able to take full ownership of what you do. You need to understand completely what you have to do. You need to be able to connect with the people around you at a very network, high network, network level. You need to have the communication skills that you need within the organization to actually have free flow of information within it so that you're constantly being enriched by your own views in terms of what's happening internally. And then, and only then, do you stand a chance of actually fighting successfully outside it and trying to target the audience which is shifting and evolving really quickly. So yeah. you're right. You know, one day thing that strikes me, David, is that you know companies are made up of people, obviously, and while it may be scary for some big companies to be able to jump in and bite off, uh, you know, Google Semantic Search and, and Google Plus using that as the platform, the interesting thing might be as a strategy for companies is to is to encourage their comp their their employees to take a little bit of time every day to get into Google+, Plus, show them how to do it, train them. I mean, get guys like uh, the Hangout uh, helper there uh, who's got a good course called you know, Hangout Mastery uh, that can really help people utilize these tools at a good level but and quickly get up to speed. And the thing is, like I said, it's so addictive that once people begin using it themselves and engaging and finding out what's out there, um, the possibility of being able to come back into the company and influence the company upwards to be able to do some things, um, it just seems like there's some opportunities. And I don't know exactly what they are because I'm still learning about this. But all I know is that if we, as you and I have talked with some companies and some, some other people and discussed some of the opportunities, big companies and small companies, I think people are starting, in some companies, I mean, it's not everybody for sure, it's a long way from it. But I think it's starting to bubble up that people are beginning to see that. Let me bring in a question from the that's yeah. from the uh, the comment area, Jim. If you could put a blue box around that, or at least just let me yeah, read in it fact, here. In fact, I'm I'm actually very glad that you picked that one up. I was going to ask about that, but Laura. I'll, I'll explain. Go ahead and ask. Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Laura's okay. asking, does Semantic Search force the small entrepreneur to be focused solely in one niche? No, as a matter of fact, no. Although certainly, if that's all you do, if that's all your business does. Yes, obviously, you know, your marketing is going to be focused on what your business does. Otherwise, why would you be doing any kind of marketing at all? However, um, a company which you know, suppose for instance, let's use an example of a company that sells razor blades. It sells razor blades, but it doesn't just sell razor blades because a lot of companies sell razor blades. So basically it has to ask itself, what does it do? What does it do that's actually different? Why does it selling of razor blades? Why is it selling razor blades different from anybody else's? And it has to start with these basic questions. And the moment the answer is evident for the company itself, 
then it has to translate across the web. And essentially, you know, if you can say that, you know, we sell razor blades with a smile, for instance, no problem. Nobody else does, you know, so this is a unique selling proposition, but you need to be able to communicate that. You need to be able to connect. And you can't just get on the web and start saying, we sell razor blades with a smile, because nobody's really going to believe you, or nobody's going to take any notice at all. At that point, you are just noise. And you need to become signal. And the only, only way you're going to become signal in a very crowded, noisy web is by basically interrupting and engaging people at a personal level, at a people level. So, I, don't, I don't want to be too noisy, but... Jim, yeah. make sure that there's no blue box around me so that David's the main star here. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're right. I'm, I'm driving, and I'm new at this. Thank you, uh, Hangout. That's okay. Nice. That's the Hangout helper. Go for it, David. <laughs> Please finish up. So essentially, you need to become that person. You need to be able to connect with people at the personal level. Well, the, and the next point of discussion is, you know, the moment I know that you're Ronnie or I know that you're Jim or somebody knows I'm David, they go, and what do you do? And you say, well, you know what? I'm glad you asked me that question because we sell razor blades to smile and nobody else does. And then the discussion comes, really? And why doesn't anybody else do the same thing? And you say, well, I don't know, because perhaps they don't think smiling is important and we do. And that becomes a huge selling point because you do it differently. And that's how you connect. That's how your message gets out there. And if a lot of, you know, if out of that connection you get 10,000 people talking about smiles and razor blades and then that becomes 100,000 and it becomes a million, you get a small percentage of a million actually purchasing your razor blades as opposed to somebody else's. And that's how you actually do it. And this is a crude example, but you can see how it, it actually connects through the personal contact. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting to me. One of the things, I'm, I'm a fairly introverted person, and I, I, was, I was talking to somebody else who was like that, and he said, you know, even though we're like that, I mean, you get into something that you really are passionate about, something you love, something that's unique, uh, you know, people people change when they get yes. on this and they begin it's, to... Yeah, it's not so much they change, and I'm very glad you brought that up as well, because a lot of people say, okay, you know, I'm introverted, I'm not a natural sales pe salesperson, so I can't really go on the web and sell. And you don't have to. But the thing about the web is, or, the, or rather the thing about the semantic web and connections and networks and social layers like Google+, Plus, is it allows you to connect at a level that actually feel comfortable. And because you feel comfortable, then you begin to basically come out of your shell because most of the times even introverted people are introverted because they don't feel they can come into an arena and be the bright lights and they feel they're being judged and they don't want to be judged and they get into this kind of situation. But when they get into their subject, they're perfectly able to communicate as anybody else. And we, we all are at that level. And creating semantically dense relationships means that we connect without the usual redundancy of small talk that happens offline. And why does it happen offline? Because offline we begin, we don't know, we're cagey, we can't really move away from another person because it's rude and confrontational. So we approach every connection with a lot of um, barriers and safeguards and our guard is up and we tend to read body language and look for the subtext and speech patterns and words and all sorts of things. You get on the web, you have none of that because essentially things are a lot more straightforward. The communication takes place with a smaller redundancy, which means its communication value goes up and the semantic value of that communication increases exponentially. And the relationships which you form are likewise a lot more productive and a lot more semantically valuable because you don't have the kind of redundancy where you feel you have to connect to somebody because conventionally now you're tied together. It doesn't happen on the web. You meet people you like, you stay with them. You meet people you don't like, well, you drift away, and they don't really notice. So because of the difference of connection, we're able to operate better. We're able to operate with a lot more surety, and that helps anybody almost work on, in, on a business level um, digitally. Well, David, I appreciate so much your coming here. I mean, we're getting to the end of the hour, and, you know, it's really been impressive. I mean, I, I, I know that... Uh, uh, the students that I uh, can't wait to get back in there. We've got two and a half more hours, three more hours of, okay. of teaching to go. So I'll be back there uh, going into some of the things on research and about uh, evaluating of the internal as well as the competition and external on, factors. On, on that note, um, any questions which come up during the lesson or any subsequent questions, I'll, I'll quite happily answer. So there's no, there's no problem. Good. I, I tell you what, you've been great. I, I appreciate both you and Ronnie. I mean, to be able to. Uh, give as much time and attention to this. Ronnie, any, any last words uh, that you have to say? Uh, 